be asked to undertake the 23 million euro redevelopment of St Mary's Mansions. It's a dockland community here. Sadly enough, there are declines when the containerisation came in around 1965. But it was still a community. And like if there was an accident that someone died, you could go to your neighbours. The people in the area, I think, are really the backbone of what is Dublin. So our very first step was, in collaboration with Dublin City Council, was to meet the residents and ask them to be involved in the design process. Well, I think it was really important being on board from day one, like with the tenants being involved, we had their say. And it's great for the children that's coming up now to see this regeneration going on. This is a flagship here. We're going to have 80 homes, nearly 180 people with 90 kids moving back into the north inner city. The role that Cluid is playing is really massive in terms of urban regeneration. We're putting a stake into the community. Because we will be supporting that community to stand together to support themselves and expect a better future. Hello, um, welcome everybody here today um, to the Irish Council for Social Housing's uh, conference. And I understand that there's about 600 people have engaged with the conference over the, the two days, which is an extraordinary uh, achievement. Um, so delighted when I was asked to chair this session uh, around um, uh, sustainable neighborhoods for all. Um, my, uh, as a former, uh, a member of the board and member of the Irish Council for Social Housing, a community uh, worker by trade and somebody who's been uh, in politics and out of politics um, and my Cork Simon days, very, very interested in, 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 um, in housing uh, and uh, delighted to chair this session. I'm also a board member of Oakley and uh, Galton, which is a small housing association in Cork. So we have a fantastic lineup of speakers here today and I'm, I've asked them all to to be mindful uh, of speaking and, and and sharing with us but also of for the for the people following them uh, so that you you get to each uh, you hear from each of the speakers but also that we also get to hear from you because we have time uh, if, if we all are generous uh, uh, we will have time to um, to have a, a bit of a discussion and a bit of a Q&A at the end. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Bob Jordan, uh, who is the newly minted and newly appointed uh, um, executive, chief executive of the housing agency. A brilliant appointment in my humble opinion. Um, a man who knows so much about housing from so many different angles from his days in Dublin, Simon, uh, one of the architects of uh, the fantastic Make Room campaign, the chief executive of Threshold, um, and then uh, as, as, as a person in the innards of Leinster House as a special advisor to, uh, to, to Minister Simon Coveney, uh, and then a great champion um, for the fantastically uh, important uh, and right-focused Housing First uh, 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 initiative. So I'm now going to hand you over to Bob. He's only a week in the job, so the questions that you will ask him, he may have some answers to, because knowing Bob, he knows a great deal, but also there might be things that come up that he will have to come back to you on. But look, let's hear from him first. Over to you, Bob, and you've got 10 minutes starting from now. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Colette. And it's a great privilege and an honour that my first outing as CEO of the housing agency would be at the ICSH conference. I do hope that we can uh, meet in person in the future. Obviously, as I'm sure has been said by many people, the networking opportunities that exist around the ICSH conference have been the lifeblood of the housing sector for many years. Um, I'd like to thank Donald McManus, who is a member of the board of the housing agency for the invitation to come here. So soon in my tenure to, to just meet you all. Um, I'd obviously like to congratulate Pat Doyle on his re-election as uh, chairperson of the ICSH. And I suppose one of the things that I noted from yesterday is the, the level of ambition uh, that Donal and the ICSH and the members have put out there in terms of delivering 5,000 uh, social homes per year over the coming years. Obviously, uh, the AHB sector was critical to the success of the last housing plan uh, really, there was only some setbacks during COVID, uh, but that's picking up. Um, I'd like to talk, I mean, listen, you know, in a way, this is an opportunity for me to reintroduce the housing agency, to say we're open for business, it's business as usual, uh, and there's a lot of opportunities to be grasped. Um, in terms of the, 
Next slide, sorry. So housing for all, listen, you've seen this slide many times over the last two days. All I want to say is, you know, this is a once in a generation opportunity. Um, there's a lot of things in housing for all that I know many of you have been looking for for many years in terms of delivery, in terms of cost rental, in terms of social inclusion, in terms of housing first tenancy. So uh, my first message is let's grasp this with both hands. And it is about establishing a sustainable housing system. I think there's three things that stick out for me in housing for all. One is obviously the level of ambition around delivery. Uh, the second is around embedding and a, a new affordable housing segment permanently within the overall housing system. And obviously the focus on social inclusion, and I think a the theme of this session today, just from talking to the other speakers, is about the focus on people, uh, the end users of housing, uh, the people that we're all trying to serve. Um, again, you've seen this table many times. I think one of the things that perhaps has given the ICSH and the approved housing bodies confidence that you can deliver 5,000 homes per year is this multi-annual funding package of 4 billion investment, 20, 20 billion over the lifetime of the plan. This is really important. And um, I think, you know, we, we cannot move forward with confidence without having this kind of uh, level of investment. Um, I suppose I, I will go on to talk about cost rental. Obviously, social housing is the main business of the approved housing body sector, but I do want to talk about cost rental as I go. Just to say, if you haven't looked at it before, uh, this is the graphic on the housing agency website. We are the housing and sustainable communities agency. It's a lot more than bricks and mortar we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about uh, transporting communities, employment, landscaping, playground facilities, community centers, people being able to remain in their community within the life cycle. Um, the housing agency, I mean, just to say there are a lot of players in the sector. But the housing agency, we would regard ourselves as an enabler, as a solver of complex problems. We work in one way or another with all 31 local authorities. Over the last few years, we worked with over 50 approved housing bodies from the smallest to the largest. And just to say that in my first week in the job, um, you know, my colleagues, the leaders in other state agencies, such as Barry O'Leary and the Housing Finance Agency, Podrick McGoldrick in the RTB, and John Coleman, the LDA, have been in touch to talk about collaborating and working together. So we're all on the same page here in terms of delivering housing for all. How can we help you deliver? There's a whole range of things. In fact, you would need very long arms uh, to you know, complete, can completely grasp all of the things that the housing agency does, but you're more than well aware that we're involved in policy, designing programs, assessing funding applications with PNA and CAF, and providing technical hands-on support to you. And I just want to say, reiterate, um, that we're, you know, we're gearing ourselves up for the increased level of demand that's going to come from your sector as a result of Housing for All. We're prepared to help you. Um, approved housing bodies and sustainable communities. This is obviously the theme of the session. Um, I just want to say that, you know, obviously, rightly, there's a focus on delivery, economic effectiveness and affordability, but let's, let's not lose sight of the other aspects of sustainability that are in the UN Charter around environmental protection, social inclusion, which is a big focus on housing for all and cultural adequacy. The national planning framework does talk about compact growth. So the idea of building on, I think part of sustainability is building on the existing footprints of our cities and towns. There is a target, this is an average target of uh, targeting a greater proportion of future housing to be within the footprint of built up areas already. 50% in the cities, 30% outside. So, I, I mean, really what the National Planning Framework is saying here is clearly we're going to need to use some greenfield sites, but yet let's, let's use the brownfield, infield, of publicly owned sites we already have. There's a whole issue about vacant and underoccupied buildings that I'll bring up here. And obviously, you know, making sure that people can live close to their employment. I mean, part of this compact growth is this idea of this, the 15 minute city that, you know, you're never more than 15 minutes away from all the local services that you need. If compact growth is about pulling people together, I mean, there is issues around making sure that people are not pulled apart due to affordability issues, the lack of availability of appropriate housing, gentrification and displacement. The housing agency, we're very involved in supporting sustainable communities. Uh, you'll be aware of the Vienna model of seminar, seminar from last year, which I suppose underpinned the whole cost rental model. Uh, we've also looked at case studies of uh, good quality design of social, affordable and cooperative housing across Europe. That was a, a report published last year. 
technical, we're providing technical support to AHBs around infill developments. Um, I know that some of you will have older housing stock where you need support around thermally upgrading it uh, in line with best practice. We can support you on that. We're providing policy advice on the town centre first policy, which is all about reanimating areas where there are vacant residential and commercial properties. I'll talk a little bit more about that. We have an in-house sustainability advisor, Dr. Aoife Corcoran. Uh, many, of you will, who, many of you will know, but is a resource again to the sector. And obviously we're providing advice to people who want to uh, be involved in building and designing their own homes in the community-led housing sector. Very briefly, um, this is a study uh, that was published by the Housing Agency in, in 2018, uh, which was written by myself and Dr. Aideen Hayden. I suppose the most important message around promoting sustainable mixed tenure developments is around placemaking. We need to have the widest possible mix of tenures, the widest possible mix of incomes living in a community. It needs to be tenure blind. In other words, you can't identify people and the tenure they live in from the design of buildings. Uh, people need to be, uh, uh, I suppose, have the ability to live through the entire li life cycle within that community through right sizing and downsizing opportunities. And obviously we need to have landscapes that are easy to maintain for the community. And um, so it's about placemaking. And some of that is about introducing residents to the community in advance um, and obviously involving residents and residents associations um, in uh, decisions around their own community. Ireland is changing. Our households are, are reducing in size. 75% of all, all households are three people or fewer. We need to design in for these smaller property types. Uh, as you all know, one bed properties are in high demand in terms of social housing waiting lists, in terms of homelessness, but they are like hen's teeth. I suppose this is an example of how our senior architect has helped you know, this development of Knock Mahaney in Cork, allowing one bed apartments to go into corner buildings with own door access. What's important about own door access? I think it's about personal autonomy. It's also about, in the case of people, I suppose, who may be exiting homelessness and need support, uh, some independence and privacy around receiving that support as well. So, and also marking out the development. Um, cost rental, cost rental is the new, you know, the new kid on the block. Those of you who've been around as long as I have will remember the NESC report back in 2004. It's taken a long time for us to get here. Uh, let's grasp it with both arms. I suppose, well, why should, uh, why should uh, AHBs be involved in delivery of cost rental? I think Part of it is because you're already involved in providing stable, secure homes for people that are well managed. It will uh, moderate overall rents in the, in, the, in, in the rental market going forward. It can make renting more secure and viable. It's financially sustainable. And obviously over the lifetime of Housing for All, there's gonna be a steady supply of these homes. But I think it is important to grasp that opportunity. I've already mentioned Town Centre first, the big focus on social inclusion uh, in uh, Housing for All. And I suppose just to conclude, because I am under time pressure and I just want to make sure I want to listen to the other speakers my, myself, uh, the housing agency is here to help you. That's why we're here. And we're here to uh, help you on not some of the problems you have, accelerate housing delivery. And we're gearing up internally here to help you deliver on housing for all. And I suppose let's all work together for sustainable communities. Uh, while, you know, while there's a, a very big focus on delivery and uh, bricks and mortar in housing for all, there is also a focus on making sure that we match the needs of the different people uh, that we work with, the different communities that we work with. So listen, that's a very big whistle stop tour of sustainability and the work of the agency. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. On mute. Uh, thanks so much, Bob, for that whistle stop tour and so many sort of notes that you sounded around you know, make the most of housing for all and the multi-annual funding that's on the table, working together, talking about sustainable communities. It's about housing, but it's also about people's lives lived in communities. You talked about vacant and derelict, and I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about that and bringing those back into life. You also spoke about um, being tenure blind. Uh, so we do have that genuine mix in communities, not segregation. Um, I also mentioned Nocknahini, and which I think is a good segue uh, and the development that's there to our next speaker, who is uh, Tony Duggan, who's the uh, Cork City Co Council architect, my architect, um, and delighted to meet him. Um, and he's uh, 
uh, he's he's got a background in urban design as well as being an architect and in lived experience of regeneration in terms of Dublin and Dublin inner city. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to to build on and add to Bob. And by the way, if there are questions, please type them in because at the moment there is nothing in my feed. Uh, so I'll have I'll just have to talk myself and you really don't want that. So um, I'm now handing you over uh, to Tony and you've got 10 minutes starting from now. Thank you. Well, good. Well, good. Good afternoon, delegates. Uh, I'm delighted to be here and to talk about Cork. And I'm going to speak about the work that my department has done and my colleagues in Cork in both housing, planning and infrastructure. And the, over the past few years, uh, that is Cork, which is the real capital, uh, creating uh, sustainable communities in particular uh, regarding housing in the terms of urban design built form and its contribution to creating neighbourhoods. In this connection, I just want to thank uh, the advice and the financial contribution from the Department of Housing and Local Government uh, over the years. The City Council has over 8,000 tenants, uh, one of the highest proportion of tenants per capita in the country. And consequently, uh, the, we're involved in the lives of these people, their neighbourhoods and the city. And so this is a snapshot of the Council's work, and I'm concentrating on five neighbourhoods. Uh, you see Cork for those delegates where we are in the, the south of the country. I'm concentrating on the north side, which is uh, city northwest quarter regeneration. Uh, that would be Knocknahealy uh, and Holly Hill. And then on the south side, uh, Dean Rock and Toker. And then on the, again, on the north side, then, and it's, these, uh, these would be regarding um, size. Uh, and say, say in, in regarding uh, Dean Rock, it would be in medium-sized intervention of 66 units, and Ergill Heights, the Glen, a smaller uh, development of 70, of 27 units. And then in inner city, which would be Shandon, six units, uh, which is a conservation project, and Douglas Street and an associated infill housing projects of about 40, 40 units. So I'll start first with the, the next slide. Which is um, uh, city northwest quarter, and um, this the background uh, to this neighbourhood uh, built in the nineteen seventies, uh, over twelve hundred units, and the, uh, it was poorly uh, insulated houses. Uh, the location had minimal community facilities, with poorly designed public realm, uh, and which led to antisocial behaviour and social problems. Renewal work in phase that started in the early two thousands. With, particularly with community facilities and a, a local uh, city council office was uh, was uh, was provided. However, by the late 2000s, it was uh, considered that the more radical approach uh, to uh, would be taken, which included demolition, decanting, and a total redesign. Uh, currently, one uh, A, uh, A, one B, and two A have been completed and. There's approximately 300 houses at various stages of planning and tenancy, which include intensive public consultation at all, at all stages. Community buildings, as known as the hub, was added, as well as the provision of facilities creating a sense of place. This in, in this complex would include the branch library, um, which uh, since uh, its completion in 2016, and uh, numbers have quadrupled by eightfold. That's just to tell you the importance of a library. Then it, I'll just speak about 2A in detail, which shows an urban block uh, forming streets and encouraging public space. Uh, again, uh, at the corners, uh, similar to Bob and said, we, we uh, uh, place uh, own door access for, uh, for, uh, for one and two person apartments. And then just a quick note then uh, on public open space, uh, which we are creating a network uh, of public open spaces with passive supervision, all creating green spaces making throughout the scheme. I quickly go on to Dean Rock then. Now, Dean Rock uh, is on the south of the city, um, again, uh, near a, a social housing scheme built in the, in the, the, the 1970s. In this case, uh, these were uh, three, uh, four um, number apartment blocks. 
And uh, these were uh, demolished. They were very poorly insulated and created, again, very poor public realm with antisocial problems. And they were demolished in 2006. And in 2014, it was agreed to configure uh, the, the site, connecting a in a positive way to the existing social housing scheme by creating streets and forming an edge uh, with existing public, uh, public park. Uh, the houses themselves are terraced. I'll just show you those, the way you can see the streets and the public open spaces. And the houses themselves then are two-bedroom, two-story houses with where required uh, a third bedroom in the attic and corner, uh, again, corner apartment units. Then we go on to Ergill Heights, which is in the, the north of the city. Uh, this is part of the Glen uh, re redevelopment and this was a similar situation to Nakhnahini, uh, that you had uh, three apart, you had three number of apartment buildings, having they were again very poorly insulated, poor public realm, created an awful lot of antisocial behaviour, and again these were demolished in the in the in the two thousands, but again the redevelopment of this is two, is two urban blocks uh, urban blocks which again creates streets. You can see the, the difference between what's been done there, create streets and a public open space. And these are how they're actually being developed. And again, you can see the public open space being created. And, and um, again, the, the, the housing blocks, the, at the ends you have apartments and, and, and in, uh, along the interior, you've, you've got uh, terraced, two, two bedroom terraced houses. So again, Whistletop, sure. Again, in this case, now I'm going to uh, concentrate on the uh, inner city areas. This is Shandon. Uh, is a re if you can see, it is a regeneration project. It's the location is at the at the corner of Shandon, with an adjacent corner units forming an end of or an end of an urban block. There's two dwellings uh, front uh, onto. Um, Shandon Street, which were 18th century in Dublin, you call them Dutch Billies. And these are gate, gabled uh, fronted dwellings and are protected structures. These were in a very bad state of repairs. And it was decided uh, that with uh, in conjunction with adjoining properties, these were developed into six apartments while keeping the original facade and the internal chimney breasts, which were part of the feature of the building. Uh, this scheme has been definitely greatly enhanced and greatly appreciated by the locals. Now, I'm approaching this Douglas Street in a totally different way. Uh, seven years ago, Douglas Street uh, and its traders were a down at heel and did have not have a vice. Uh, incidentally, then, it was decided that we'd actually uh, create a, a, tr a trading associate, uh, create a traders association and a residence association, so and that they could voice their concerns. And the main concern was antisocial behaviour in the in the on, on the street. If you look at the street, you'll find uh, that the backland of the street uh, had a whole series of car parks as well as on the streets that were adjoining were very very, very had very bad um, edges. So and there so. That is the, the aerial view, uh, which you see on the right on the right hand side. Uh, again, uh, at this stage, uh, it was tackled. The antisocial behaviour was tackled, but then it was other issues were brought to the fore, which would improve uh, the street. And these included, say, painting derelict buildings, and also uh, having a, a system whereby a green of the street and a parklet was included. Uh, this in, in turn, then they were persuaded maybe to close down the street, uh, close the street for for uh, for a day, and you'd have um, you'd you'd, cre you'd, cre you'd create um, a, 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 an event, and you 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 would re create an event, and this actually uplifted the whole street and the traders, and it actually gave them a great impetus. And in the end, they actually won a national uh, award for the best neighbourhood in the country, both north and south. So if it, when I spoke to you about the, uh, the, uh, the backland, this in turn has been created into a very, very successful housing scheme, uh, which has created an edge. And I suppose in summary, the lessons that we have learned would be ongoing 
consultation with local communities and elected representatives that's crucial. Provide quality dwelling units that are homes, create streets and in turn places and so form sustainable communities and a city for which we are we are all proud. Thank you. And again, we are Cork. Thank you. Thank you. So, so much, uh, Tony, for that um, uh, uh, view of sustainable communities, not just as a nice idea, but been made real and in a range of different places in Cork. And I'm lucky enough to, you know, to be, to be living in Cork. And we all think we're very blessed to live in Cork. But I, I, I know the places um, that Tony talks about. I've sat on that parklet, uh, even though I live on the north side, I do travel to the south side occasionally. Um, so it's a fantastic example of, 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 of what can be done um, and housing at the heart of it and a mix of housing at the heart of it. Because again, remember Bob reminding me once upon a time that actually 40% of the people on the housing waiting list are people who want to live in single uh, homes and single uh, um, places and uh, uh, you know building that mix and also building community. So thank you very much for your, your inspiration um, and, and, and delighted to be able to, to, um, to benefit from, from, from what you've done, uh, Tony. Thanks so much. So we're now going to move on to Ali, um, who is going to speak to us. Uh, Ali's background is uh, she works for the Heritage Council and she's, um, uh, I think, a planner by, by trade. Uh, and she's spearheaded a range of really, really innovative uh, initiatives, including the collaborative town, um, town centre checklist, uh, which is a, a great, great, great um, uh, tool for, 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 for people. Because again, I think we're all, I come from a small town, I come from Macroom, and we're all concerned about, you know, the towns that are doing great. Well, we're not concerned about those, we are concerned about the ones that are in a bit of bother. So um, over to you. Uh, Ali, looking forward to hearing your presentation and the questions have begun to come in for Bob and hopefully for Tony now as well. So over to you, Ali, you've got 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Great to be here. OK, um, I'm just going to dive straight in. So just to say there's four parts to this presentation. I'm going to talk a lot about collaboration, uh, winning pathways and just to really give an overview of the Collaborative Town Centre Health Check programme, which I set up. So yeah, um, basically, why did I set it up? Bas uh, people kept coming to me in the Heritage Council and saying, can you help? Can you help, please? You know, our towns, this is before COVID, obviously. So that was in 2016. One of the first people that came to see me was Tara Buckley from RG Data. So um, kind of had to think about it. I had no funding, um, just went around the country talking to the universities, various people. Actually, Dr. Aoife Corkin was one of the first people that I spoke to and just asked people would they work with me um, in setting this up. So now we have 15 towns. We have 70 partners. We do workshops. We set up projects, project teams. I designed a methodology right at the very start. And also just to say we've got two national awards under our belt. So Tralee and Letter Kenny. So yeah, it's been very, very busy. Um, then around 2019, again, with some of the workshops, that um, slide there at the bottom left, that is from a feedback report that I wrote. We did a workshop with the Scottish in December 2019, and we started to call for a town centre first policy. Um, so the CTCHC has been very much, you know, pioneering this approach. Um, and yeah, then we were lucky enough to be included in the programme for government. So we've been on this journey for quite a while. How do we work? We have five pillars. We work with the government departments, regional assemblies, local authorities, third level organisations. I could not thank those organisations enough, including UCC, UCD, QUB, IT Sligo, just fabulous people. Business groups, civic groups. Um, I should really say as well, my background is sort of community planning. My postgrad dissertation many years ago was on community empowerment and urban regeneration. So I have a love of trying to help places and people. Uh, one of the things that we, one of the outputs that we actually did right at the start, and I was quite surprised that I had to do this, was to set up a colour coding for land use in the towns in our country. Um, so yeah, I did this with Dr. Luke Kelleher in UCD and also with Kerry County Council. So all our towns use the methodology. We're all able to compare how everybody is doing because we're all using the same um, sort of process. So that's the beauty of having a programme and not having an isolated project. So the Collaborative Town Centre Health Check programme, this is a map of the towns that we have at the minute. As I say, the first workshop that I did, I had 70 people at it, the second workshop, 130. So the numbers were just going up and up and up. And as I say, like just, it took off basically. So I tried to sort of split it into strands, Brexit was coming. So I tried to focus on the border towns and also the towns on the Western seaboard. 
So we also have 45 towns in a waiting list. And this is the up-to-date map that I've got for the waiting list. So the two local authorities to come on board actually as of last week are Leash and Wexford. So there's just huge um, energy around the country. People have reconnected with their place during lockdown and they really want to get going. So this is the process that we have developed, as I say, with the universities, with the students, you know, architecture students, planning students, marketing engineers, such a range. Just lovely to work with them. Systemic problems and data gaps. Um, in terms of the program, again, we can shine a light. We can look to see what are the gaps in the systems that we have at the minute. And these really, this cumulative impact is actually sort of blocking um, progress as far as I can see. So, we, you know, there's not enough um, data on land use. There's not enough data on building conditions. Also the heritage and cultural significance of our town centre buildings, traditional buildings, that doesn't seem to be captured as much as it needs to be. And also it's very hard sometimes to get ownership information on data. And what we find in a lot of the town centres is that maybe the ground floor is owned by one person and the upper floors would be owned by somebody else. So it's like a rich tapestry that needs to be explored. Um, in terms of the 15 step, this is the methodology that I created right at the start and give it to the universities and ITs and said, OK, work with us here, work with me. We'll do it all together. It'll be a collaboration. So we basically take the towns on a journey and it is a hard thing to do because, as I say, there's not much data out there. So one of the key steps that we do is step two, which is the land use survey. And I just showed you the color coding for that. We do footfall surveys, business surveys, consumer surveys, ownership maps. Um, it really is um, perfect to do it on GIS as well. So here's some of the output. This is Sligo Town Centre. So what we've discovered in Sligo is that it has a commercial vacancy rate ground floor of 18.4%. The norm in the normal range is 5% to 11%. So you're not ever meant to go above 11%. And we also find that there's approximately 200 vacant buildings in Sligo Town Centre. And we've actually just started with IT Sligo. We're going to resurvey it. Um, Tipperary Town Centre. So I work with Tipperary Task Force. I was asked by Minister English a few years ago, about two years ago, would I help Tipperary? So we've found 87 um, vacant buildings in Tipperary Town. The retail vacancy rate, commercial vacancy rate is 31%, which on a European level is unheard of. Um, and again, with Tipperary, we're going to be doing that in another few weeks. So it's really, really important to get this data, to create this data. It's not a secondary data set. It's primary. We, we do it in the field and it's peer reviewed. So what I find as well is that the towns really want to create and own their own data. They want to control the narrative of their towns. Okay, sort of winning pathways to funding. There's the URDF, um, there's the Historic Towns Initiative, the Heritage Council, there's an increase in housing for all for that fund. Also the Rural Regeneration Development Fund. There's a lot of funds out there, um, different departments. So what we recommend is, you know, this is the creation of the baseline. So if I just give you Letter Kenny, for example, we started with Queen's University to do look at Letter Kenny in 2018. Then a few months after we published the report, they won the National Enterprise Town, um, the uh, National Award. And then HTI, we gave them 200,000 to do up some derelict houses in Chapel Lane. That photograph, I was sort of looking at it today thinking, there's no people, but can I just explain that was lockdown? <laughs> so Letterkenny is obviously a busy town. And then more recently, they've got 10 million under URDF. Town centre regeneration, really, like we need to get going. We need a town centre first policy. As I say, we've been advocating for that, pushing for that since 2019. Um, and support is needed for the CTCHC programme because we've got a massive waiting list. Compulsory um, CPO, compulsory purchase orders, also need to be supported by compulsory sale orders, which is what other European countries do. I do think we need a land management strategy. Um, I actually put that in the submission for the Heritage Council to the National Planning Framework. Uh, one of the things we're really promoting as well, community improvement districts, which the Dutch are, are, are doing, and also business improvement districts. In Ireland, we only have four town centre bids compared to Scotland, which is 40, and they have the, roughly the same population. So we have a very underdeveloped system um, to support sort of, you know, cultural and commercial development in our town centres. Community development trusts, uh, town development trusts, city development trusts, conservation area regeneration schemes. I'm just about to start a pilot to do a CARS community-led scheme in Ireland. Then we also have heritage action zones. And then really what to say, you know, I, I mean, in terms of the presentation today, I just really want to highlight and reinforce, we really need digital dashboards, we need digital data, everything has to be data driven. Okay, so collaboration, just a few sort of examples of events we've had this year. It's been obviously a difficult year with everybody having to Zoom. <laughs> 
I don't know if people have had enough of Zoom. Anyway, um, okay, so like we did an event in February with the European office um, with the IREO um, looking at a strategic environmental assessment. What are the indicators that we need moving forward for town centres? Because we've got to get ready for the Green Deal. We also did um, a webinar on compulsory sale orders, which was really interesting, fascinating. We had the Scottish and the Danish involved in that. Um, the target number for that was 80, and we had actually 380 people on the day. Um, and it's gone out on YouTube and I can put the link up. And then more recently, actually, we did a Young Planners Forum with UCC, um, which was last week. And again, that was just really, really interesting. We're trying to give a voice to young people so that they can have a say and shape in their places. And it's about empowerment, as I said before. And then we have an event coming up on Meanwhile Use with Frank O'Connor and Jude Sherry. So yeah, it's very active, very busy programme. We have Reading in the Years event coming up in November where all the towns that are in the programme and the towns that you know, are on the waiting list who want to come and meet everybody. That's going to happen. So, yeah, just in terms of benefits and impacts, um, it's a data driven program. It's looking at evidence based. We're trying to create, we're trying to create baselines so we can do the ex ante and ex post appraisals, which is what the European Commission really wants to see. And uh, the IREO is very encouraging, and they basically said to me in January, just keep going. Uh, we want to create local regeneration engines. Sorry, regeneration engines, and also the whole sort of approach is about participative democracy and a focus for local communities. So just to finalise and last slide to say, the, this is my vision for the programme. As I say, I started the programme with no funding in the first year. So it's something that I, you know, with everybody else that I work with um, externally, I'm very proud of what we've done. Um, it's four strands are needed, four phases. You know, we've got to look at the building renewal plans. We've got to create those. We've got to get social cost benefit in place. That's what the European Commission is looking for. We need an enabling policy. And also we need to create a culture of maintenance of our buildings so that we don't actually end up with those vacancy rates. We've got to get them down and we've got to sort of start to train people. And again, that's employment opportunity. So to me, it's a wonderful opportunity. We're at a very exciting sort of juncture. Um, and, and as I say, I'm totally passionate about towns and i um, very proud of this programme. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ali. What, again, a whistle stop. And as somebody who grew up in the, on the main street of a small town and lived over the shop, um, I, um, it, it, it's a fantastic, uh, you know, it's a great way to live, actually, and a great way to grow up. You said you love people and places that comes over, but it's not just passion and it's not just heart. There's hard data and evidence uh, behind all of the things that you're putting forward, uh, practicality too, in terms of the checklist, and some great policy ideas that I hope uh, people here in the room, uh, including the the, the new uh, the new the new man on the block, will take will take on board. So now we're going to move to uh, Pierce uh, Pierce Shields last, but by no means uh, least. Uh, Pierce uh, has um, is, is comes from a cooperative housing uh, perspective. He's going to talk, uh, he's, his own background is in education uh, and he also lectures in philosophy and he's bringing us back to, to the human side of things, uh, the people uh, who live in these spaces that we've been talking about. And we've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm hoping that we'll have at least 15 minutes on that. So over to you, Piers, take it away and you've got 10 minutes starting from now. Thank you. Thank you, Colette. Um, and my presentation will be relatively short. Um, and of course, you mentioned my philosophical background or background as a philosopher. I once a philosopher, I suppose, always a philosopher. So there is a certain philosophical slant to what I'm going to say. Um, you know, when we talk about sustainability and housing, there are, in my view, or from this perspective, the broadly two aspects. The one is the, if you like, the hard aspect, the aspect to do with buildings, building design, energy use, and so on. All these things we're really very familiar with um, in recent years, the, the, the need to concentrate, in, concentrate on making our buildings and our communities more sustainable from an energy use perspective. The other aspect is, I would say, not a technical aspect, but it's, a, it's the human aspect. How do you create sustain communities that are humanly sustainable or neighborhoods that are humanly sustainable? So really I differentiate between those two aspects. In the first instance, uh, sustainable housing as we might expect is generally used to describe the process as it applies to the housing industry. In short, less waste, more reuse and recycling together with lower life cycle environmental impacts and costs better reliability, less maintenance, and greater user satisfaction. 
So I use that, if you like, as a, a definition of that technical side of sustainability. However, rapidly changing circumstances, particularly with the climate crisis, will see an increased focus on this technical aspect in the coming years. And Cooperative House, Housing Ireland has already undertaken and continues to undertake significant work in the deep retrofitting of some of our older housing stock. And it's hard to see how very significantly increased investment in this area can be avoided in the short time period. Now, I'm not suggesting we should uh, seek to avoid it. I think it's absolutely necessary and I think it's inevitable to meet the targets that we've set ourselves that a great deal of resources will have to be put into a deep retrofitting of the older housing stock. Because we have, I would suggest a relatively short time period to ameliorate the effect that our current way of living is having on the planet. So I think that's ongoing, if you like, that's something that will develop and increase as time comes, as time goes on. However, the creation and maintenance of sustainable communities, that is communities that are humanly sustain sustainable is not a technical question, but has much more to do with complex questions of human relationships and the creation of structures and processes that ensure engagement on the part of the members of a community in the life of that community and in the decisions that largely determine the quality of life in that community. Perhaps a significant positive element in the social changes we face uh, due to COVID is that there's a more general awareness of the need for more fundamental change, uh, an increased of, uh, awareness of the value of what we might call, and, and this is uh, more and more commonly seen, this uh, term commons, what is called the commons. It's an old term, but it's, it's finding new life, I think. Um, and I'll say something more about that in a minute. As opposed, and that's opposed to the values that currently prevail in our focus on the individual, uh, on the rights or, or needs of individuals. So that's a differentiation between what we call the commons and the individual. Cooperatives in their many forms seek to identify the areas of common interest and aim to provide the, to provide the structures and processes that make um, make them sustainable. The general history of the cooperative movement would indicate that it began uh, with the organization for self-reliance of the flannel weavers of the Rochdale Pioneers Equitable Society in 1844. Um, but in fact, there was a much earlier example of a successful, if short-lived, cooperative in County Clare in 1831. While the Rallaghan Cooperative in County Clare lasted only two years, it provides us with an example of the benefits of a structure that valued mutual interest over the needs and, dem and demands of the individual. <clears throat> I mean, this is a fascinating history, this, the history of the Rallying Cooperative, and it is available, it's published, and it is really very, very interesting from a historical and from a human perspective. And I might mention here that there is, of course, a long tradition in Ireland of the Mehel, where people come together to work for mutual benefit. So the, the cooperative in its many guises has a long history in Ireland. I think probably in the past, there were stronger, uh, more active, um, generally speaking, cooperatives, the, the agricultural cooperatives. And I do think uh, some cooperative ventures have suffered from um, more recent corporate sort of cultures. They've been swallowed to some extent by the corporate cultures. But I do think uh, what we face now will place increased uh, emphasis on mutuality. Cooperative Housing Ireland, as a cooperative of cooperatives, seeks to embed this value of mutual support into the communities in which it's active. And this presents us with a variety of challenges or questions to be addressed. So firstly, are the historical structures, both in terms of cooperatives themselves and in terms of their regulation, are they adequate to provide the necessary assurance in the new environment in which we're now working? And I, and I would suggest that the environment is going to change rapidly in these coming years. And secondly, the question of what is the relationship between cooperation and community development? And can cooperatives provide leadership in terms of training and of their own experience in the development of communities that are humanly sustainable? Cooperative Housing Ireland is currently addressing both of these questions, actively addressing them, and is putting significant resources in place to support the key cooperative value of mutual support as a path to sustainable communities. I am aware that the concerns for sustainable neighbourhood goes well beyond the interest of any particular approved housing body. And it's only in recognition of mutual interest and shared learning 
in the sector as a whole that progress can be made. And here I'd refer back to what Bob said about these various agencies involved in the sector working together. I think that's very healthy and very helpful. I said I would say just one final word about the commons. It's an old phrase and, you know, it was there were commons, you know, that were publicly available to people and they more or less have disappeared or disappeared in, in changing circumstances. But there is one area of commons and there may well be more, but there's one that's right next to us in most villages and towns, which is the library. The library really is an example of that principle that um, those books and other material are made available to the community. Members of the community don't have to buy them. They're made available. And as I understand that that particular commons model has been extended, for example, in Belfast, where there is a tool library, where there's a, um, a library for tools, working tools that people can go and borrow. So it's, it's those kinds of values of the benefits of working for and with each other, rather than that individualistic emphasis that, um, that we're focusing on in, cooperative, uh, in, cooperate, in cooperate, cooperatives and in cooperative housing. And that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you very much, Colette, back to you. Wow, well, thank you so much. Um, uh, Piers for elevating us and reminding <laughs> us um, uh, what we're all about, um, uh, that mutuality that you spoke about and how I suppose important that kind of uh, emerged as in COVID um, when, when so many things dropped away, how mutuality kind of took its rightful place again. Um, and the metal of it. I uh, went to a film last night, which is a bit corny in parts, but it was good in other parts, called Herself, which is about a woman building a house in her own, in a neighbour's back garden, and there was a mehel involved. Uh, but I think the, the sentiments that, um, that you've, 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 um, uh, you've noted today, um, uh, and the commons, I love that concept of commons, uh, and the library, and, and it was interesting that Tony mentioned the library as, as, as part of that. And I know there's places where they borrow tools, but I, I've also heard of a place in the UK where they borrow people, uh, that if you need to have a chat with somebody, uh, there is a kind of a, a list of people. Um, and I know that's something I can see Sean Moynihan on the screen here. That's something that's at the heart of a loan and what it does, uh, that whole kind of connecting people with people. Anyway, I'm going to stop. Fabulous presentations, Bob. Uh, uh, Tony, uh, Alison, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Pierce with your philosophical uh, human take. Thank you. Now, your questions. There's more than you'll be able to answer, uh, but we'll, 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 work, we'll work through. Um, and I'm going to put three out at a time for the panel to respond to, okay? So you need to jot things down as I speak them. And I'm jotting them down in order of likes. So we're in like culture here now. Um, so the first one, and I think it was particularly um, uh, uh, asked of you, Bob, but again, we're going to ask three, but, and anybody can come in. Uh, how can we ensure that specialist housing, uh, for example, for older people, will be included in developments in neighbours neighbourhoods? And there's actually quite a few questions about disability and universal design as well, but hopefully we'll get to those. Um, and uh, then there's a question about how many of the 75% of households that are three or fewer are this size because they're not affordable family size units for young couples to afford to have two children? Goodness knows it's a good question. Be interesting to know if anybody has any thoughts on that. And uh, one, one question is around, can the housing uh, agency uh, connect in and support the smaller AHBs, uh, which are particularly important in the small towns and villages. Um, I think there was a question here for you, Tony, is what percentage um, uh, of the houses were um, you know, disability uh, proof? And also who funds the, um, the, the collaborative towns, uh, uh, centres, uh, heritage council checklists? So there's more than three. So I'll put them over to you and um, Bob, I'll call on you first, and then um, uh, I'll go in, in order, then Tony, then Alison, and then Pierce. Thanks very much for the questions, uh, everybody. Um, I suppose in relation to older people, um, it's important that we, we need to include, obviously, across the entire housing system, from the planning process to refurbishment, the re retrofitting of existing properties, uh, provision for older people. It's so important. Like, 
I, I suppose it goes back to what I said earlier about the range of housing sizes uh, that are needed within each development. I do know there was a policy that the housing options for our aging population policy framework, which kind of has joint actions between housing and health, is looking towards having 30% of new housing uh, being built to universal design and an even higher percentage for apartments. So I suppose that's how we build in housing for older people going forward. And obviously, um, there is clearly an advantage to promoting independent living for older people as well. Um, in terms of the, the regeneration question now, I am, I am new, but I, I do know that we, we, we certainly are helping AHBs with small scale regeneration in local towns and villages. And if you drop an email to regeneration at housingagency.ie, uh, we'll take it from there. And in terms of the other question, I don't know the answer. Um, you know, I suppose the question is really about the sort of sense that because of the inadequacy of housing is there, that's there, are, you know, people are being squeezed into smaller units. And obviously, clearly, that's something we need to resolve over the period of housing for all. Thank you, Colette. Thank you, Tony. Anything to add? Yes, I'd, I'd say most of the houses that I'd agree with Bob, and most of the houses that we design are houses are houses for all. In particular, the corner units are, are for apartments. And in the case of Nocknahini, there was one actually built. We knew a person going in and one was actually built. Disability can, can be quite be quite difficult because every, everything is quite is, is, is can be you know could be bespoke, uh, but definitely for for units that would be at corner units where they have very small gardens, uh, we'd actually we actually allow for 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 mobility in cases like that, and in the Dean Rock houses it was interesting that for corner units particularly where there were family units we had a four bedroom house that had a ground floor. Um, bedroom which could easily be ad ad adapted uh, for a disability at, at some later stage if that was the case so that type of thinking has, is is in disability and accessibility is kind of evident in in all the schemes that we do and what percentage was one of the questions of i'd the... say to be about 10 percent but about 10 to 20 percent at the moment okay thank you tony cunningham from the irish wheelchair association asked that question uh ali um where do you get your money? Do you have enough? Um, no. You work with Bob? <laughs> that was a question. <laughs> Where do we get our money? Okay, so the CTCHC, thankfully, it was only one year that we didn't have any funding. So then the Heritage Council Board um, got very much behind it. So there is funding there at the minute. But as I say, we are included in the programme for government and it's very much linked to the Town Centre First that we had been promoting and advocating for. So um, the wording of the PFG is that the Town Centre First will be led by the CTCHC approach um, to gather data and to lead on actions. So um, really, we're waiting for the PFG to see you know, how that plays out. Um, as I say, we have a waiting list of 45 towns. Um, also, the regional assemblies are on board. So um, you know, I'm obviously working with them to try and look at the European funding. But I mean, fundamentally, um, I don't have a team at the minute. And really, that's what I need because I'm at a scale now where, you know, I'm one person and, and I really would like to have, you know, support staff and technical support staff would be really useful. So messages to ministers if they're listening um, and housing for all, because there's quite a few sort of good promises in there, but that needs to be backed with, with, with resources. Bob, about smaller housing associations, um, or does the housing agency, how do you relate to smaller ones in terms of the small towns and regeneration? Well, you know, we work with both big and small housing associations, like in terms of impact, there's two types of impact, I suppose. One is about large scale developments and delivering at scale. But the other one is about enhancing the capacity of people to help themselves. And we've worked with very small housing associations with very small numbers of units. Um, but that has kind of increased their thirst and ambition to do more. So obviously, in terms of the town centre first, I mean, obviously, we're contributing to that policy group. You know, uh, and it'll be, it'll be a little bit clearer, I think, by the end of the year, Ali, kind of how, how, how uh, what the actions will be. But clearly, you know, we look forward to working with you. OK, and it Thanks. Like, sorry, um, just say, I mean, it'd be great to see the Twine Centre first because, you know, it's um, 2020, June 2020 was when the programme for government came out. So, yeah, I mean, it really is, you know, everybody is sort of phoning me asking about TCF. So, yeah, absolutely. And Pierce, have you got any comments? And I was also going to reference a famous co-op in Cork, the Key Co-op. Oh, yes, indeed. Very well. much in the equality space. 
and has gone from strength to strength. And yeah. actually there's a little film about them uh, coming out. And I didn't realize that their housing came from the AIDS crisis, that that's why they got into housing, which is kind of quite interesting and sobering. Anyway, any comments? Uh, to just to say something about, I, I mean, that there is a danger. There can be a tendency to think uh, of older people and people with disabilities sometimes in a rather negative way as a group of people for whom we need to do things. But actually the very presence of somebody in our community who's been on the planet for 80 years, you know, brings by their very presence, they bring something to their community. It, it may not be immediately visible or may not become available to the community in a very obvious way. But we know it ourselves to have old people amongst us, to have people with disability, even I would say even more so to some extent, they People with intellectual disability, for example, they, they experience the world quite differently, differently than we do. And they have a lot to teach us um, about how we can broaden our own views of the world. So I think, I think it should be seen as a, as a really positive thing that we build, uh, uh, enable these people to live in our communities. Um, so, so seeing us all in our diversity as an asset and as somebody who's going to be turning 60 very soon, I certainly... I uh, think that that's how we should be thinking about it. But I also am aware that I live in a house that's much too big for me. Um, as my children have very unkindly left me, uh, as they should be uh, in their 30s. But anyway, um, so, so yeah, but I think you're absolutely right. It's a reminder that that, you know, the groups that we're kind of having to look after are actually people who bring uh, uh, a lot to, to communities. There's one question here on energy. I thought it might be a good question to put to you. Okay. So, uh, any thoughts on future energy requirements in housing and also what we can do to improve the circular economy with embodied carbon and new housing new build? How do we reduce embodied carbon and reduce CO2 in new build? And is alternative forms of construction volumetric, modular? Any thoughts, Tony? But I thought maybe Bob, Ali and Pierce might also have a view. And that's probably as much as we're going to get to today. So, Tony? Energy. Well, energy. Uh, under, on, if the, the best example of to, to kind of put that in perspective is that if the energy uh, ratings for two thousand and seven and between two thousand and seven and two thousand and fourteen have actually doubled, and that has like, actually gone further now with NZEB, which are effectively zero energy. So buildings are being produced now that require very very little energy in, in practice and have very, very high thermal, thermal qualities. And uh, compared to what had been, say for instance, in the case of the houses of Nakahini, which some of them would have had a block. I mean, they were even, you know, they were very, very poor standard, but the quality of houses now are, are first class. Okay. Um, uh, Ali, any views in terms of energy and for example, the, you know, the, the, the work that you're doing on heritage, because sometimes I think we think these are mutually exclusive. Yeah. yeah, I mean, absolutely, because phase two of our program is all about buildings, you know, um, building renewal. But I mean, the most sustainable building that you're ever going to have is the one that already exists. So, you know, it's really important that we get back into those buildings and to try and repurpose them. Uh, you know, a lot of the retail will not be retail ever again. Um, also, I should have said as well that the upper floors that we survey, you know, those are very high as well. It could be 80 percent vacancy rates. So, yeah, I mean, there's a challenge there. Um, I, I was sort of waiting for the town centre first before I moved into phase two, but I'm actually going to start now phase two in the next few weeks um, because you, know, you can understand that the towns that have these high vacancy rates really want to get going. So uh, we have the methodology already for phase two. Um, so, yeah, exciting times ahead. OK, Bob, you've got an, any, a minute to say um I would say just very quickly on energy, we need to be open to innovation and also we need to tackle the issue of fuel poverty. I mean, there's a lot of uh, publicity around ri rising fuel prices. We need to make sure that people are not, um, you know, you know, are, are not expending any more than they, they need to on, on fuel. And obviously, just in terms of universal design, the agency has been involved in the development of the, the housing strategy for people with a disability on behalf of government. So uh, we're working towards year end on that. That's probably all I could squeeze in, Colette, in the yeah, minute. Yes, you get, you, you spoke I get the final word. the last oh, word. Well. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to echo what Tony said, I mean, the houses that are being built now really are extraordinary in terms of, um, you know, the house I grew up in, suburban Dublin, the houses that are being built for social housing now, the standard of them is really top class and energy use is minimised. I would, however, just one quick note of caution. Um really there's a more fundamental issue for us all, I suspect, which is to do with overall with our relationship to the planet. 
And that is a philosophical question as much as it is a technical or practical one. But I do think we need to think carefully about um, our relationship to the world we depend on uh, as we go into the future. I'm going to. Um... Could, could I make an interjection there that the houses that we, the, this example of the of the buildings in Shandon, which were originally 18th century buildings that we actually renovated, they're back to almost modern standards, and and it, as well as that, we actually provided lifts in there. So the whole thing for inner for inner city, for inner city housing and conservation go hand in hand, and that's an example okay. I just want to give. So. So, so sustainable communities are happening. They're real, they're doable. We've got a mail of people in this room, in this Zoom room and right around the country working on it. Uh, we've got some great inspiration and can do today, not insurmountable uh, problems, but not insurmountable. Um, and I wish everybody well. I especially wish Bob well in the journey that he's taking. And uh, we're all, you know, blowing fair winds around you. So, uh, and thank you, Ali. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you, Piers. And thank you for listening. And we got to some of the questions, not all of the questions, but we've had a fantastic discussion. I'm delighted to be part of it. And we're about to finish bang on time. Thank you, Colette. <laughs>